I had the greatest job in the world, and that's working with dogs. Best in show winner is the French Bulldog. Winston won the National Dog Show. It was amazing, it was exciting. And to have a dog to be number one dog in this country, you have to have great nutrition. And I always fed Pro Plan, just like us. When we eat well, we feel good. And I just love that food and what it's done all these years to all the dogs I bred and all the dogs I've shown. Welcome to Pure Dog Talk. I am your host, Laura Reeves, and it's the first Monday of the month, so therefore we must be talking to Dr. Marty Greer on Veterinary Voice. And Marty has some really important insight for us today, you guys. We're going to talk about puppies and kids, which, as Marty and I were just saying, in today's world, sounds like a really great thing to talk about. So we're going to talk about it. <laughs> um, and we're going to talk about bringing home your new puppy, introducing it to your children, how puppies and children interact appropriately, and how to make that be a really positive experience. And, and I really want to talk about some breed specific things because I do think, you know, herding breeds or working breeds and some of those things have some very specific issues that we can talk about. So welcome, Marty. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great to see you. It's absolutely fabulous to see you. And I, so let's talk about it. I mean, I think of, I think you're such a great person to talk about this from a breeder perspective, thinking about herding breeds you know, just as a right off the top, some of the things that we do that are specific for herding breeds with puppies and kids and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, and there are definitely differences. So I guess the first place I would start is if you don't already have a breed that you have selected and you have children, pick a breed that's good with kids. You know, why start off with something that's likely to set you up for a failure when you could get oh, let's say a Labrador or a Golden Retriever, which are notoriously outgoing, happy dogs. And, you know, they're just easy to live with. They, they're they great dogs to have around children. So, you know, don't start off. And I don't want to badmouth anybody's breed, so I'm not going to specifically call out breeds that aren't good. But don't start off with a dog that you have concerns about. Start off with something that's happy, friendly, outgoing, and was raised in an environment that's likely to be successful for you. And I think that's so important when we talk to people getting a puppy, when we talk to our breeders who are placing puppies, make sure you've got that good match, right? So I, for me, that's really important. I won't ever say that having a child is a no-go for my personally, for my breed. Um, but I do watch how the parents and the children interact. And if the children are not respectful of the adult dogs and the puppies, when they come to visit, it, it, that's, that's a, that's a no go for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have sent people out of here without a puppy and mm -hmm. I'm not the kind of person that won't place puppies in households with children. There are some people who won't, I think children and dogs should go together. I think they're an amazing combination. My kids were raised with dogs and my dogs were raised with kids and it's incredible. Um, my son has his 20th high school reunion this weekend. I'm like, really? Like how in the world? That happened, but we raise dogs and kids together and I think it's a great combination, but you wanna be careful. And yes, there are situations where if the kids are inappropriate with the dog or really afraid of the dog or the parents aren't um, working well with the children that I just simply have to say to them, you, you know, this is probably not a, a good match. Let me help you find another breeder. Um, and and let's, let's just not- Let me help that. you find goldfish maybe. <laughs> I mean, I've had a few of those over the years. Um, so let's talk about what are your suggestions? I have mine. What are yours for when you send that puppy home with the family with children? One, two, well, three, it depends. top three. Yeah. It depends on the age of the kids. Um, for starters, I don't leave the children and the dog unattended ever until uh, maybe the dog's five. <laughs> and the kids, at that point, then we might have some hope of making it work. Um, so I'm very careful with that. And so I, I don't leave them unattended. And I, I raised babies with cats and dogs. So, you know, don't tell me that you think I don't understand because I really do. But that's what X pens are for. That's what um, play pens are for. That's what crates are for is, and you can put X pens up across doorways. And if a doorway is too wide for your um, gate to fit across, so you can use an X pen. There's a lot of devices, a lot of ways to do that. And it's also a great way to introduce 
a dog to children or a puppy to children and vice versa as they can see each other without the puppy jumping on the child, without the child shrieking, without the child, you know, having a, a meltdown or without the child doing something else that's inappropriate with the dog. So it's a really safe way to start off is for them to see each other and interact with one another, but through the pen, through the X-Pen or through the crate. Yeah. And so my, one of my big rules is the, the family comes, I really encourage them to bring the children. I want to meet the children. Yeah interact with children yeah. children sit down on the floor when they are yeah. with puppies their bottoms are on the floor that's really important yes. i don't want them up yeah. in the air at any level um and <clears throat> we had an incident with that when we had a litter of bernie's mountain dog puppies our attorney and his family came to visit and our attorney who was like six four was holding the puppy and dropped the puppy so from that moment forward and it's of course it's your attorney so he's already got a relationship with you it's i mean our personal attorney. Um, my rule from that point on was nobody holds a puppy unless they're sitting on the floor because you can't fall off the floor. You can tip over, you can slide off the lap, but you can't fall off the floor. So hands down, nobody holds a puppy, adults and children in my life, unless they are sitting on the floor. If you're too old to sit on the floor, mm, too bad. <laughs> I've got to do I'll get you a cushion. Right. Here's a cushion. Um, so bottoms on the floor, very important. Obviously, I mean, like this seems really simple, but pay attention. No poking eyeballs, no pulling ears, no pulling tails, no squeezing paws, right? Appropriate child interaction is appropriate child interaction. And, and I think that this is what you talked about. Kids and puppies are so important together. I think one of the reasons they are important is because it teaches children respect. Yes. and responsibility and that is what puppies are there to provide yes yeah when our kids were really little we had some rules you know the dog was allowed to only eat in their crate the kids weren't allowed to eat in the dog crate at all and children love being in dog crates but you know no kid went in a dog crate because that was the dog's safe space that was if she got overwhelmed and was it was just too much for her she could go in her crate and nobody would bug her there so i have rules about that and i had rules about food and um our rules about food were as soon as the child was old enough to walk they were carrying a cup full of dog food over to the dog bowl and feeding the dog because i wanted everything that happened at the dog bowl with a kid to be a positive interaction. They weren't over there taking the kibble out of the bowl. They weren't over there messing around with it, but they were the source. That was the only source of food that that dog got once the kids could walk. And so the dog very quickly said, okay, food off the high chair, food out of the cup into my bowl. Love this kid. This kid tastes great. I, I'm loving it. So you've got to make it a really positive experience. The other thing that I have had good success with is if I take a dog someplace that I'm going to meet with children whether it's on a walk or at the park or you know at, at an event, whatever, I would take along Reese's, those little Reese's crackers with the cheese in between the layers, mm -hmm. and I would give those to the children, that you know, a cup or in a bag or something, and say, "Here, feed the puppy." The reason I did that instead of dog kibble was if the child accidentally misunderstood, it was not quite old enough to understand what you were saying, and they put the kibble in their mouth. Or could, you know they they would eat dog food they would choke on it something terrible would happen but if they have Reese's and I used to do Reese's peanut butter but of course there's so many kids with peanut butter allergies that went out the window um, so we're just gonna have to deal with gluten and cheese you know but if a kid puts those in their mouth and they're allergic it's not going to be the end of the world because the parent can fish that back out but i want every interaction my dog has with children to be absolutely 100 percent positive and if that meant meeting a strange child with a handful of reese's crackers with cheese in the middle i want my dog to go oh yeah i mean all along the way i want the dog to say children taste really good and i don't mean mouthfuls of children i just mean being around kids is a fabulous wonderful experience right well I don't know. As as a kid that grew up with dogs and ate the kibble out of the bowl, I'm relatively certain I, you know. <sighs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> My kitten chow when she was a baby, when she was just toddling, and it was w back when it was round with a hole in the middle, mm -hmm. and one of the dog managers was interacting with her and said, honey, what do you have? And she opened her hand and she said, oh, they're Cheerios. I said, no, Cheerios don't come that color. <laughs> kitten food no let's let's try that again so yes it won't hurt them unless they choke on it but you know nobody wants to think that your kid is eating dog food cat food whatever it happens to be right. so just to be on the side make it something oh, that would crap. be yeah not not a little treat not a piece of long you know just in case the people are a little freaked out by that 
Um, okay, so bottoms on the floor, always with um, treats. The other one that, and and I want to reiterate what you said, that um, dogs in crates, not kids in crates, or if the kid's going in a crate, it's its own crate, not the dog's crate. Um, yeah, uh, my parents, yeah, hobbled me at one point with horse hobbles because I wanted to go play with the goats. So I understand containing children. <laughs> oh, that's pretty I, funny. It, it was it was a fact. Um, so so containing children and separating children and dogs very very important. Yep. And what's your? I mean, I know what my favorite age is where I think kids and dogs can be a little more. I I'm like ten. What's your thought on that? Yeah, maybe a little younger than ten, depending on the child and how they were raised and what the breed of dog is, how many mm -hmm. dogs there are, and you know some variables. I think ten is generally pretty safe, but sometimes, you know. Teenage boys are the number one species to get bitten by a dog. And I do call them a species because they're an entity unto their own. No one is like a teenage boy. Um, and so there's a reason teenage boys get bitten by dogs more often than adults and teenage girls and young children because teenage boys have out-of-body experiences. And I was taught this by my son's guidance counselor. They have an out-of-body experience. They do stuff that's really not smart. And then when you ask them why they did it, they they say, I, I don't know. And the guidance counselor said they really don't. They just have an out-of-body experience. So you have to make sure that even when they become teenagers, that you're still really careful. My nephew came to visit us when we had a rescue dog. I had a rescue corgi at my house um, that I had just picked up like the day before. He came. He wasn't raised around dogs. He came up a flight of stairs and lurched at the dog. And I'm like, she's a 10 year old Corgi that was with an elderly woman. Oh no, this cannot end well. Well, fortunately the dog was bomb proof, but you just have to realize teenage boys are teenage boys. So you have to, you have to constantly remind them of what the rules are and a lot of things. I've also had one client, he told me a story with, he was in the exam room with a dachshund and he said, I walked into the room and my grandchild was holding the dachshund by the tongue. And the dog had wide eyes open with the kid's hand wrapped around his tongue. And he's looking at the owner going, could, 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 could you fix this? I'm like, man, that is one cool dachshund because not a lot of doxies would have put up with a kid. A dog with a Danny breed are not going to go right up your arm. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. True Panion is revolutionizing medical insurance for pets by providing the best possible experience to our members. And it's not some space age dream. It's happening now. We pay your veterinarian directly while you're checking out, and we're the only ones who can, which means you have decisions in seconds, and you don't have to wait for reimbursement. So unlike with other providers, you'll keep more money in your pocket. Ask your veterinarian if Trupanion can pay them directly, because there's pet insurance, and then there's Trupanion. That's a really good segue, and and I know most of our listeners know this, but this is a this is a podcast that they might share with their puppy buyers, and so I want to think about what are some of the body language things that we can talk to our buyers about, right? What what are our cues? Ears, eyes, lips, tail, right? right? So let's talk about that a little bit. So tails wagging aren't always happy tails. Tails wagging can be some form of arousal. So be careful with that. <laughs> yeah, so be careful with tails. Wagging tails are not necessarily a happy dog. Um, really watch their face, their their eyes, their body language. If they have that whale eye where you can see the white around their eye, they're scared. If they kind of look at you from the side, they're they're worried. You know, just really think about if they're backing away, be careful. Um, we were down in New Orleans a few years ago, and there was a, a pit bull terrier with the kid's arms wrapped around the dog's neck. I'm assuming it was their dog, and the dog was so whale-eyed. I was, and the parents are just completely oblivious to what's going on. And I, you know, here we are in a public space in New Orleans. It is not my place to go over and say, you know, this is this dog is going to bite your kid. Right. But it's kind of tempting to to say that. So you've got to watch their eyes. You've got to watch their body language. If they're crouching, they're not happy. Um, and there's a whole series of really great images online mm -hmm. uh, that are wonderful images of body language. There's a whole we'll, one that- We'll put some in the show notes for listeners. I will get some of those images because I yep. think the whale eyes, ears, ears are a huge tell for me. Lip licking, right? When, yep. they're, when they're getting their tongue out of their mouth. Um, and <coughs> the tight lips, right? So yep. I really watch what are their lips doing? 
Yep. And they're trying to tell you something. So really pay attention because it's foolish for you not to really be on top of things um, because you need to be protective of your dog and of your children uh, because wants a dog bite to happen. And as soon as that happens, then your dog has a history of biting and that can completely change the opportunities you have to keep that dog in your household. Um, the insurance companies give you one bite and not two. After the first bite, you are likely to lose your insurance or to um, end up having to get rid of the dog or change insurance companies, or I don't know, you could get rid of your kid. Um, but most people opt for that choice. Uh, but sometimes that's exactly what you have to do is you have to think about what happens if you do have a bite, because if you do, your insurance company has every right to end your insurance. And that because of double indemnity and double indemnity means that if the dog bites once and there was, oh, let's say a million dollar claim for injuries to the person, then they would have um, to pay that. But if there's a second bite, they would have to pay $2 million. So they're not going to do that. That's just not going to happen. Um, so the other thing that I think is really important when we're talking about biting, and this is, I'm back to the, what we can do as breeders, and I am super, in, super insistent about this, bite inhibition, teaching the puppies bite inhibition from very, like as soon as they're toddling, um, they don't get to put their teeth on me, even when they're little gummies, right? And they're just gumming me and, oh, it's so cute. Well, it's not cute. And so, so we you know, the, in the litter, the other puppies and the dam teach the puppies about bite inhibition. They scream and cry and, mm -hmm. and so oh, I shouldn't do that. And so then when they come to us and think we're either the mom or the sibling, we need to have some of that same reaction. Right. And right. so I, I really work very, very hard on bite inhibition. No bite starts at my house at like three weeks old. So thoughts on that. Absolutely. And the, if they don't lose bind inhibition, it's just, it's not, it, they have to learn it from siblings. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a singleton, that makes it a lot more difficult because they do miss that opportunity. Yep. Um, but yes, you definitely need to um, let that happen. And, you know, I don't intervene much when my puppies are roughhousing and, and carrying on and there's a little bit of that scuffling going on. They need to learn the opportunity. That is, a, that is a chance for them to learn. So yes, no teeth, no teeth ever touch human skin, period, end of discussion. Um, as soon as teeth touch human skin, the recommendation, at least it used to be, is to make a yelp, like not a, not yell, but to, to yipe like a puppy would yipe yep. and pull back and ignore the puppy so that it learns very quickly that anytime teeth touch human skin, those flat-faced, hairless humans that we live with, those people that don't really, they, they're, they're really wimps and we can never do that. Um, so I think it's, it's a very good idea for people to understand that that rough housing is part of what they learn. And if they're a singleton, they've got to find another way for the puppy to learn that bite inhibition. It may be from their mother, it may be from other puppies that are um, friendly or an adult dog that's friendly enough to, to teach that. Because there are things dogs can teach dogs that you and I can't teach dogs. Yeah. And I think that that really is, really is important. Having raised a number of singletons, it is my biggest yeah. ongoing complication. Um, and so um, uh, a yipe, a little pinch on the nose, walk away, whatever it is, we, it is absolutely, and I was, I was talking with a breeder friend of mine that had used my stud dog and, and she's like, wow, you can teach them not to bite you? Like, Ooh, yeah, the little late figure. And, and so it, when you have those four and five week old puppies that are coming along and they want to play and they've got their little shark teeth, no bite is a thing. You absolutely yep. can and must teach bite inhibition to your puppies so that when they go home, they know to go in a dog crate, they know to walk on a leash and they know not to put their teeth on people. Yep. Yep. Housebreaking that you can always learn that later, but you'd better learn those things because you're not going to stay in your happy home if you haven't learned those. Um, the chart that I was looking for and I've found, and I know we'll send this out is Lily Chin, L-I-L-I-C-H-I-N, doggydrawings.net. She has this amazing chart of this little Boston Terrier named Boogie. Um, and it's got all these adorable mm -hmm. line drawings that help you really understand body language. And it, it's a cartoon type of drawing, but it's easy for even a child to see these 
Now, of course, when they're two, they don't get it, but the time they're five, they should start to figure this stuff out. So this is a really nice um, chart to use. We actually have this blown up on a, on a blanket or an Afghan that we hang in our vet clinic so that even my staff that doesn't pay attention to anything on their computer will see it hanging in the clinic. So there it is. The type of thing There's you can send home with your puppy buyers. You know, if you have brand new pet dog people that have never had a dog before, this is a really great tool. Yes. Yeah. And of course, AKC and, and a number of other organizations have great materials, but the simpler, the better. And so this is really an easy way for people to learn this. Perfect. Perfect. Well, we will make sure that that is in the show notes. And then I think the other thing, the only other thing I would add to the conversation about kids and dogs and, and just close supervision, close awareness by an adult and giving them the opportunity for the joy that comes from kids and dogs. That's yes. really important. Yes, there's nothing much more fun than a 10 year old boy riding his bike carefree, you know, around the yard with a dog hanging out with him. I mean, it's just, it's sort of that iconic image of how children should be able to run and play and hang out with their dog and really enjoy themselves, you know, take off down the lane and and uh, go down to the pond and catch frogs with the with the dog. I mean, there's some really fun stuff. And unfortunately, I think a lot of Americana has been lost in um, video games and in parents having to be so protective of their children that they can't just go do cool, fun stuff and hang out. But it is who we are now, so we have to be careful. But dogs can really be an important, iconic part of growing up. And, you know, every kid wants a dog. Every kid wants a dog when they're little. And we saw that during COVID is all the yeah. kids that wanted. Now they're, they've been hammering their parents for years. Can't we get a dog? Can't we get a puppy? I want a puppy. And finally, the parents are like, well, you're out of school and I'm home and there's a dog. And so, yeah, we're going to get one. And so I think that's where we saw this huge surge in not just in adults getting dogs, but in families getting dogs with, with their children. And it, it has been really fun for them. I think it's great that we've had that opportunity to spend our time with our dogs and our kids and, and to, to redevelop those relationships. Yeah, that's to me, I mean, a whole, whole bunch of the reason that I breed dogs is because of that. You know, it's nice when I get a show ribbon or whatever, but, you know, watching watching a kid, you know, like drive down the road, looking out the window with their puppy, I mean, it's just, that's yeah. it. Yeah, it's pretty great. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And breeding dogs with your kids, that's a really fun activity mm -hmm. as well have appropriate homes and you're doing a good job with your breeding program, that you're doing your health screenings and you're socializing your puppies and doing all the things that you should do. I had to pull my daughter more than once out of the back of a minivan when they were uh, there was a family picking up their new puppy and she'd be clinging to the puppy as they were trying to load up. I'm like, no, no, hon, you, 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 you can't go home with them. Um, the puppy goes with them. We can't keep them all. Um, but it was a great experience for our kids to raise dogs and you know, well, we were, we raised livestock, we raised a lot of things, but the responsibility they learn with training a dog and feeding a dog and walking a dog and cleaning up after a dog and all the things that have to happen. I think that's such a valuable life lesson that they cannot learn responsibility any other way than to have that real life experience of a, a living being dependent on them. Correct. Yep, exactly. Okay. Well, Marty, thank you so much. As always, our Mondays are better when you join us. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. Thanks. All right. You have a great day, Marty. Thanks. Bye-bye.